picture the scene. A colossal statue of the city's protector goddess sits astride the grand marble columns of the city center, her spear glistening in the golden light, signifying from miles away to anyone who would dare challenge her might and the might of the city she protects that there is no hope of victory against them. With her divine sanction and protection, this city, once a peripheral polis, has emerged from the fire of endless battles to dominate the entire region, and, after finally subduing the previous ancient empire, her supremacy is unchallenged. The spoils of war, and the enforced tribute from the far-flung corners of her new empire, have paid for this mighty new colossus, a physical testament to their newfound wealth, and, ultimately, an enduring testament to the golden age of this city and the power of its tutelary goddess. Yes, of course, we're talking about Golden Age Athens and the Colossus of Athena Promachos, which towered over the city for a thousand years. Standing over 30 feet tall, it was built in 456 BCE, just after the Athenians had survived their existential defense against the ancient mighty Achaemenid Persian Empire, immortalized in the battles of Marathon and Salamis, and concluded in the Battle of the Eurymedon. After their hard-fought victory, the Athenians organized an empire, euphemistically called the Delian League, under the pretense of defense against further Persian aggression, and extracted heavy taxes from their fellow city-states. With this newfound wealth, they rebuilt their city, building the now iconic Parthenon atop the Acropolis, and, of course, erecting the colossal Athena Promachos. One of the ironies of the Athenian Golden Age, famous for the works of Socrates, Plato, Sophocles, and many more, is that it was paid for by the taxes of the Delian League, a product, unambiguously, of empire and an empire won by the might of this city's protector goddess, Athena. But Athena, like Marica, was not merely a protector. She was known and worshipped for many qualities, like wisdom and craftworking. And each of these was separately worshipped in the various cults throughout the city. Yes, there was Athena Promachos, the warrior, or rather the champion, but there was also Athena Parthenos, the virgin, Athena Polias of the city, Athena Nike, the victorious, and so on. Each of these epithets represents a different aspect of the goddess, and, importantly for our purposes, offers a historical glimpse into how her composite myth was created over time. As we will see, Landell's own protector goddess, Merica, is beloved and worshipped for many reasons, not least of which is as a champion of the Erd Tree and of Landell, but going far beyond just that. Like Athena, Merica has many forms, and uncovering and deciphering these forms can give us clues as to just who she was before the Golden Age of Landell. It will take many episodes to fully explore the depths of Merica's past, her Newman origins, and her battles with rivals and erstwhile allies. But we begin here by unraveling the thread of Merica's story immediately prior to her ascent to godhood. This is the story of how, in the wake of the empire that preceded Landell, an outsider rose to become the golden goddess of a new age. Last time we began the process of uncovering the civilization that immediately preceded the current Erdtree Empire, by analyzing the fortified manor. Let's begin today with its sister site, Stormvale Castle. Honestly, Stormvale is so rich in detail it probably deserves its own dedicated episode, but for now let's just review its major features for the purposes of this episode. The iconographic and architectural features of Stormvale are quite characteristic of the earlier society which we've been calling the Saint and Tree Stratum, in reference to the ubiquitous presence of the saint statues and the great tree reliefs. As a reminder, this relief depiction is not the Erd Tree, 
as relief depictions of the Erd Tree are abundant in Langdale and are always quite consistent and distinct from this relief. Right away, as we approach the front gate of Stormvale, we can see the Great Tree relief, leaving no doubt as to when and by whom this castle was built. In Stormvale, this relief is replicated several times on the exterior of the Tower Keep, again foregrounding its significance. Architecturally, Stormvale is in the same style, albeit more grand, as the other Norman-style castles of the game. Like Castle Morn, Castle Soul, and Castle Redmain. And yes, the Fortified Manor, aka the Round Table Hold. If we leave aside for a moment all the Golden Lineage banners and Banished Knight paraphernalia, one of the other major features of Stormvale is the presence of the Hawk statues, like the grotesques seen at Notre Dame or St. Vitus cathedrals, which we also see in the Fortified Manor. Finally, of course, we have the Saint statues, which can be found in various locations throughout the game. So far, nothing all too surprising, since we already know Stormvale belongs to the same culture and era as the Fortified Manor. But there are two extremely interesting areas of Stormvale which bear specific mention. The first is the processional way that leads to the hidden face of Godwin. We call it a processional way because, though it is now long forgotten and fallen into disuse, this area is lined with statues in a manner highly suggestive of a procession. You can see that while some of the statues are destroyed, the remaining ones are placed on pedestals and correctly oriented against the flanking wall. This is not what you would expect if these statues were simply discarded down here. Rather, this appears to be an area which was used for a very specific purpose, though long ago. The statues themselves are highly interpretable. The saint statues, either the book or sword version, are mostly destroyed while the only two that remain are libation statues of a woman pouring out sacred sap blessings of the tree. We'll just call these libation statues from now on, since they are in the form of a common artistic historical motif of the libation, the ritual of pouring out a liquid, usually water and or wine, as an offering to the dead or sometimes to gods. These libation statues are identical to the bronze versions we see elsewhere in game. More on that in a moment, but here in Stormvale, they are clearly made contemporaneously with the saint statues, as they are made of identical material and rest upon identical pedestals. We only find these statues in the Saint and Great Tree stratum, and in fact we've already noted on the doors of Fortified Manor, we can see the Great Tree relief below a lintel depicting a full libation scene. So we can therefore only conclude that these statues do not depict the bestowal of blessings of the Erd Tree, Rather, they show the blessing of its predecessor, the Great Tree. The original function of this processional way, as it leads down toward the boat burial site at the roots of the Great Tree, will leave for an upcoming video. But this area speaks to what Stormvale was like when it was first built, and there is no doubt, along with the Great Tree reliefs that adorn the front gate and inner keep, that Stormvale was built as part of the Saint and Great Tree Empire, before the age of the Erd Tree and it had a religion based on great tree libations poured out by cloaked priestesses. The second area of Stormvale which warrants a full discussion is the chapel within its walls, where we first come across Ragier. On first pass it seems to be a relatively unremarkable chapel, replete with golden lineage regalia, and with a statue of the Crucible to Erdtree transition in its apse. But if we compare it to similar chapels across the lands between, things get really interesting. You see, there are four nearly identical chapels in-game, and together they tell a striking story. One is in Redmain Castle, one in Castle Soul, Another is the Chapel of Anticipation, and finally the aforementioned Stormvale Chapel. Externally, they have near-identical Gothic architecture, libation bronzes adorning the niches, as well as the Great Tree wooden doors we've seen before in the Fortified Manor, complete with the libation scene lintel. 
Internally, they share nearly identical layouts, and more importantly, they all have the bronze libation statues, bestowing the blessings of the sacred tree. All but one, that is. The Stormvale Chapel is the only one of the four that does not have the libation statue, but instead has the crucible to Erd tree depiction. To us, this can only mean one thing, that the original statue has been replaced. And sure enough, even on the exterior of Stormvale Chapel, the original libation statues remain, as they do on the other chapels. This is the clearest example of the kind of iconographic replacement we've been alluding to, and it definitely shows later replacement of the libation statue with the crucible statue. And this one statue replacement speaks volumes. We know that Stormvale predates Godfrey, the Stormhawk crest shield makes it clear that the ancient crest of Stormvale was a hawk, now long forgotten after its replacement with all the golden lineage iconography. Similarly, the Stormblade Ash of War says it's a forgotten art of Stormvale. It appears that the people that built Stormvale, whose symbol was the hawk, were part of a great empire, the Saint and Great Tree Empire, and practiced the sacred ritual of Great Tree Libations. When Godfrey faced the Stormlord alone and conquered the castle, the process of selective iconographic replacement began, starting with replacing the Libation statue in Stormvale Chapel with the Crucible statue. And we know that from the last episode, this statue is revered by Godfrey and his followers specifically, as it represents the distillation of the Golden Lineage and the Erd Tree from the many possibilities and unwieldy power of the Crucible. Godfrey's throne room shows the same process taking place, with the crucible statue being clearly replaced in front of pre-existing intricately cast bronzes, which, not coincidentally, also show the libation scene. For what it's worth, in the concept art of Godric's boss room, we can see a victory column upon which rests a libation statue, which has evidently been replaced by an Erdtree knight in the current version of the game. Likewise, Godfrey's statue, strangely enough the only statue of the man seen in-game, was likely added afterwards, and currently sits in front of a bronze of Sirach. And though it is difficult to say for sure, based on comparisons with the other castles of this period like Castle Morn, Castle Redmain, and Castle Sol, as well as the long-forgotten older areas of the castle, it seems likely that even the characteristic golden gilding of Stormvale is a later addition, the ultimate symbol of the decadence of the new regime. Across the chasm from Stormvale, perched atop an isolated sea stack, is the Chapel of Anticipation, which is clearly of the same stratum and holds just as many secrets as the castle itself. We've already touched upon the chapel briefly, but it overlooks an area of equal importance, rich in iconography and forensic detail that most players will miss as they're being quickly dispatched by the grafted scion. First, to place this area chronologically, based on the saint statues guarding the perimeter and the hawk statues on the arches, this area must have initially been built in the same era and by the same people as both Stormvale and the Fortified Manor. No surprise there based on its location. The crucible symbol is carved into the central plaza, just like the one we see carved into the round table itself, linking these two as the only physical representations of the crucible symbol in-game. Likewise, the grafted scion drops two very important items. The first is the ornamental straightsword, whose weapon art produces the crucible symbol, and whose description states that, quote, after falling from grace, the dregs of the golden lineage sought power and purpose in the past, end quote. It seems that Godric and the dregs of the golden lineage sought to reclaim the power of their past, and it is no coincidence that the grafted scion is found here, a place of imminent importance to Godfrey's kin. This place is, after all, where we, the Tarnished of No Renown, start the game, and presumably where all Tarnished rise after receiving the call of Long Lost Grace. These days it is nothing more than a harvesting ground for Godric and his grafted scions, but what was it originally? 
Well, the name, Chapel of Anticipation, makes it clear that the chapel, at least, was built for the purpose of receiving or anticipating the arrival of New Tarnished. This makes sense with all the Golden Lineage iconography around. It is also structured in much the same way as the mass grave in the opening cutscene, where if you look closely you can see bodies disappearing after being blessed with sacred incense, just as the narrator says, Rise now, ye tarnished, ye dead, who yet live. In all likelihood, what we are being shown here is the process of dead tarnished in the so-called Badlands being sent back to the Lands Between, where we are anticipated in the chapel by our maiden. But this is obviously not the original purpose of this place. Earlier, when we told you that the four libation chapels are identical iconographically, that was a bit of a fib. Because, well, while the bronze statue is clearly of the same cloaked woman as the others, she is in a unique pose. If we contrast this to the libation variant seen in the chapels, and to the chthonic variant with the mudra pose seen in the catacombs, then we start to see the scope of this ancient religion. There are the libation statues in the overworld, celebrating the bestowal of life-giving sap from the great tree. Then there are the chthonic variants, seen only in the catacombs, symbolizing the process of death. And between these life and death scenes, we have a unique depiction, in the Chapel of Anticipation, the border between life and death, where the tarnished, ye dead who yet live, are called to rise. Outside the chapel, of course the eye is drawn to the giant statue of America that oversees the proceedings, but what about the other statue of America in the Chapel of Anticipation? It's so unassuming you might have even missed it, but it's actually right here in this shot. Indeed, this tiny variation of the libation statue is unique within the whole game, and like the round table does for Godfrey, it starts to tell the story of his counterpart. Queen Marika. Last time, we used the Fortified Manor, aka the Round Table Hold, to peer behind the curtain of Godfrey's legacy, and we concluded that he and his closest circle of knights, who drew power from the Crucible, made a vow with Godfrey, who became their lord, an act symbolized in the Round Table itself. We also explored the inspirations of Godfrey's story from Celtic Britain and Arthurian legend. That process continues here. For example, the Golden Beast Crest Shield that the Grafted Scion drops is clearly based on a real-world artifact called the Battersea Shield, one of the most significant examples of Celtic, or to be more specific, Latin, art found in pre-Roman Britain. So obviously, the developers are drawing heavily on Celtic inspirations for their story of Godfrey, his Crucible Knights, and the Golden Lineage. But what about Merica? Well, even Merica's legend is opaque, let alone her actual story. Her legend, like that of Godfrey, seems to draw heavily on British legends from the edge of the Roman Empire. Aside from the obvious allusions to the imagery of crucifixion, the inspiration for the distinctive pose of her statue, which is found in every church of America and even in the opening cutscene, seems to be a famous Victorian era bronze statue of the Celtic British queen Boudicca. Boudicca was a warrior queen of a Celtic British tribe called the Iceni, neighbors to the Ordovices and Salures, who give their names to the twin heads of Godfrey's Crucible Knights. Like Arthur, much of Boudicca's story comes from much later legend, but from Tacitus we at least know that she was a great warrior of the Iceni tribe who rebelled against the inexorable Roman advance through Britain in the 1st century AD. Though she famously lost this rebellion and was in fact killed, she is remembered as a hero of British history, as a warrior queen who united her local tribesmen under the banner of independence, sort of a proto-William Wallace character. Victorian era Brits in particular loved her story, and during that time, her two most famous depictions were commissioned. One, finished in 1905 and still standing near Westminster Pier in London, 
shows Boudicca and her daughters riding gloriously off to battle in a war chariot, seemingly the inspiration for America's distinctive pose. And the other famous depiction of Boudicca, not as a warrior queen, but as a mother, is also perfectly mirrored in the other depictions of America, embracing her two young children. Of course, it's difficult to say for sure, but perhaps even the name Merica is a fusion of Mary, Mother of Christ, and Boudicca, a fusion of Christian and British female heroines to create a terrifyingly powerful, yet pious and maternal, God Queen for this new world. Of course, we can't take this inspiration too literally, but it is interesting to note that Godfrey's Arthurian inspirations the names of Ordovis and Siluria, and Merica's inspiration from the legend of Boudicca, all tell stories of heroes at the edge of a waning great empire, the Roman periphery of Britain. These were peripheral peoples who either resisted, collaborated with, or succeeded the Romans in the British Isles. Godfrey and Merica's Erdtree Empire did not spring from nothing, it rose from the ashes after the collapse of its predecessor, the Empire of the Great Tree. That is why all of the early Godfrey and Merica iconography is shared with this earlier stratum, best exemplified in the Fortified Manor and the Chapel of Anticipation. Merica and Godfrey were peripheral people who turned the cataclysm of imperial collapse into an opportunity to forge a new kingdom under a new sacred tree, the Erd Tree. And just like the legend of Arthur, the legend of Boudicca clouds much interpretation of her origins. Of course, she is now remembered as a great but tragic warrior queen, but who was she actually? Likewise, what does the game actually tell us about Merica's origins? Well, we know she was an outsider, a Newman, and related to the Eternal Cities. We know she was an Empyrean eventually chosen by the Fingers, clearly not forever an outsider. And we know that in the early days of the Erd Tree, she personally bestowed the blessings of the Erd Tree herself, according to the Erd Tree's favorite talisman. And if we take a closer look at that talisman, we can see exactly what this means in a more literal sense. Merica would pour out the sap blessings of the Erd Tree from a sacred vessel. If you want more context for the ultimate meaning of this, please check out our videos on Erdtree Births and Elden Ring's Circle of Life. But how do we reconcile the fact that Merica is depicted in this libation pose, and yet we have all of these other statues depicting the same thing from an era that clearly seems to predate Merica? The libation statues seen in Castle Sol, Redmayne, and Stormvale do not seem to show a single individual, they are always cloaked women, seemingly an order of libation priestesses. And in the intricately carved doors we've mentioned several times, we can see this full ritual on display. This scene shows several cloaked women preparing and pouring out the sacred libations. But there is one libation statue that stands apart from the rest, and it is right here in the Chapel of Anticipation. Above the archway, in a tiny niche, sits a statue, made of newer marble, and likely a later addition, depicting a woman, not cloaked like the rest, but with beautiful long hair, bestowing the sacred blessings. This, of course, is Merica, the bestower. So here is what we may conclude from all of this. Prior to Merica, there was already a religious practice of pouring out the sacred sap blessings which is why these statues are found all throughout the lands between, even in areas which clearly predate the Erdtree Empire. And in the initial days of the Erdtree, Merica bestowed these blessings herself, as she evidently positioned herself as one of these sacred priestesses in those early days. Since we now know that this was an order of sacred priestesses which long predated Merica and was associated with the Great Tree, it seems that Merica's innovation was as the Great Tree Empire was lost during the Age of the Crucible to tie her fate to that of the nascent Erd Tree. This time, instead of a whole class of cloaked priestesses who would bestow the blessed sap of the sacred tree, Merica was the sole bestower of the Erd Tree's blessed sap. If you've seen our analysis on sap baptisms, you will know what comes next. 
Merica is the one who controls the orthodox birthing process of the lands between. But this wasn't always the case. We know this game's obsession with genealogy trees, so if you consider the Erdtree birthing process to be orderly, well delineated, a representation of order like a modern phylogenetic tree, then what came before it, the crucible, was anything but, with no differentiation between species and individuals mixing and matching traits. Perhaps it's no surprise then that before the age of the Erd tree, in the age of the crucible, birthing was more chaotic even amongst America's own children. While it is often assumed that Godwin was her firstborn, our new understanding suggests that her children with Godfrey during the age of the Crucible, the age whose end is symbolized in the Crucible tree statues, were Moog and Morgoth, and that the reason she so vehemently supported the transition to the age of the Erd tree was, in fact, the disgrace of these omen births. Perhaps Godwin was the first of her offspring to be born by the new orthodoxy of Erdtree birthing. When she says, The Erdtree governs all. The choice is thine. Become one with the order, or divest thyself of it. To wallow at the fringes, a powerless upstart. She is clearly speaking to Godfrey here, who began as a powerless upstart at the fringes. But she is trying to convince him here to abandon his old ways, and to fully embrace the Erd tree and the Order. Again, this is precisely what is symbolized in the statues in Round Table Hold, the chaotic crucible becoming the orderly, singular Erd tree, and the birth of the Golden Lineage, a refinement into a proper phylogeny. America convinces Godfrey to abandon these old ways and usher in a new age. Everything that was associated with the power of the crucible and its tendency to birth chimeras instead of cleanly delineated forms became taboo, even including Godfrey's closest knights. Isn't it interesting then that outside the walls of Langdell we can find a collection of misbegotten said to be disfigured due to their contact with the crucible weeping, and amidst this scene, one misbegotten can be found praying to a saint statue. This was a time during the saint and tree stratum, before the later orthodoxies of the Erd tree and the Golden Order, when the crucible was not taboo, but was still considered divine. At least some among the survivors in the lands between still remember that time, but they are few and far between. The rest of the story of this era is told in stone, so to speak. Merica's many statues, like those of Athena, reflect her various roles. Merica the defender of the city, Merica the victor, and Merica the bestower of blessings. Together they tell the tale of her evolution from a member of an order of priestesses to the golden goddess of the age of the Erd tree. As we've established, there was a period in the Lands Between's history defined by worship of the saints, the priestesses who bestowed sacred sap blessings, and of course, the source of the blessings itself, the Great Tree. The Great Tree symbol is found all throughout the Lands Between, as we've seen, but before we conclude, one place in particular bears special mention. The Colosseums. They have the Great Tree Relief, of course, but there's something else that's very peculiar about them. You see, a Roman Colosseum is circumferential, closed on all sides, what was called an amphitheater, meaning having theaters on both sides of the stage. The in-game Colosseums, however, are actually not amphitheatrical, they are more like ancient open-air theaters, with one side open to a vista. This may seem like just a matter of artistic freedom, but it's a curious choice. If the developers wanted a generic coliseum, why go through all the trouble of modifying it? Well, in fact, the whole point of this semicircular design is to provide a fitting view for the spectators. If we take a look at the view from the three coliseums, what are they actually looking at? They all face towards the central sea, 
and while two of them potentially face the Erd Tree, which of course would make sense, the Lanedale Coliseum actually faces away from the Erd Tree. How could this be? It's almost as if, when it was built, it was pointing towards a view which no longer exists. Perhaps it faced the Great Tree, the same Great Tree that is depicted on its doors, and the same Great Tree which has since been destroyed. Join us next time when we continue Marika's story and finally reveal the scope of this Great Tree Empire, its relationship to the Eternal Cities, its destruction, and how it led to the age of the Crucible.